Okay, so in the 1980s, um, my grandparents lived in a, a small council flat um, in, in a high-rise tower block in, in Sheffield. And occasionally at family gatherings um, in their flat, but only when we, we pestered them, they would reluctantly fetch what my grandmother called her gypsy table. And this gypsy table was a small wooden table uh, with a circular top about waist high with space for at most, you know, a few cups and a, and a teacup. It had three turned legs uh, that were arranged in a tripod uh, for stability. But this was no ordinary table because it was a, a magical table. And it was magical because it could host uh, spirits. And to evoke the spirit, uh, two or more people would place their hands on it, linked like in a, in a seance, but they would stand rather than be sitting. And then one of my grandparents would speak aloud into the ether to invite a spirit to join us. And we'd all fall quiet and uh, you know, in, in anticipation, um, looking at the table for any signs of life. Spirit, show as a sign if you are there. And there would be silence and everything would be still. And my grandparents would say, Spirit, we, we await you. And nothing would happen. But then, almost imperceptibly at first, that gypsy table would move very slowly, very slowly rock back on two of its tripod legs, raise its third, and then slowly rock forward to resume its rest position. And of course, the air was electric at that moment because of the arrival um, of a spirit. So let me. Next slide. Brilliant. Thank you. So, humans, us lot, We've been uh, summoning spirits into inanimate objects for millennia. Uh, the ancient Egyptians, they summoned something they called ka, which seems to have meant uh, living breath. They summoned the ka of their dead ancestors into the body of statues. And sometimes the living would parade these temple statues in festivals. So the dead, with their eyes painted wide open, they could see the mortal world again. And newly crowned pharaohs, to prevent spiritual interference from dead political enemies, they commanded the nose of their enemy's statues to be chopped off to prevent their spirits from breathing, which would force this car to depart. But not just dead ancestors, um, gods inhabited the temple statues. And to maintain their divine presence, they were tended daily. A priest performed, uh, as some of you may know, uh, the opening of the mouth ceremony. And they would touch the statue's mouth, eat, um, ears, eyes, nose, with ritual implements uh, to give it the power of breath, of sight, smell, and, and hearing. And on auspicious days, the temple priest would place the insulted statue on a boat, sail it along the Nile in full view of assembled crowds, and when the boat approached the river bank, you know, worshippers would gather to ask the god questions and gain spiritual guidance. And the god, trapped in the statue, so to speak, able to see and hear but not talk, would communicate by rocking the boat back and forth on the water. Not just the Egyptians, uh, the ancient Greeks maintained the presence of their gods within their temples with animal sacrifices, prayer, and dedications, uh, votive offerings. Uh, in the Iliad, uh, petitioners ask the statue of Athena to save the city, but she declines by turning her head away. Uh, the Greek magical papyri, which is actually Egyptian, is a collection of manuscripts dating from 100 BC onwards. It contains several spells for ensouling statues. Uh, Neoplatonic theurgy, uh, the system of magic um, perfected by Iamblichus uh, and his followers in late antiquity, that describes the practice of ensouling statues. And the early Christian polemicist Tertullian, writing in the second century AD, he reports disapprovingly of all these pagans 
conjuring spirits that communicate through the movement of stools and tables. So although as a kid, I didn't know it at the time, my grandparents and, and, and I were participating in this very ancient practice. And once this gypsy table was ensouled, it could answer questions. It could rock once for yes and twice for no. And we could ask it anything, you know, it could foretell the future, it could reveal secrets. And if we were lucky, the table actually, and I've seen this with my own eyes, would actually walk across the carpet floor, rocking back to raise a tripod leg, then rotating like an inclined wheel, place its leg back on the carpet a few inches further forward. And so despite the evidence of our senses, most of us thought this must be impossible because obviously wooden tables can't walk and can't be possessed by unseen spirits. So the skeptics amongst us immediately asked my grandparents to clear off, to remove themselves, to take their hands off the table because obviously they were moving it with their, their hands. And yet, even when operated only by skeptics, the table still moved. And I remember one family member upturning the table to inspect its underside to try and discover the hidden mechanism. Um, I tried it just with my little sister, me and her, just two young kids linking their hands, no one else with their hands on the table, and we too felt and saw the table move. So it obviously was magic, obviously magic, or, or was it, was it something else? So my grandmother claimed that her family had acquired the table from a traveling gypsy. And gypsies, even in the 1980s, had this reputation of being a magical folk. So this story fired my uh, kid's imagination. You know, I imagined a colorful horse-drawn caravan, a distant relative of mine entering, an illicit exchange, uh, an old crone sitting in the darkness, that kind of thing. But the truth is actually much more uh, mundane. So in the Victorian era, occasional tables with three legs were very popular. They were mass produced commodities and they were marketed as gypsy tables because they were very small and easily transported. And the marketing Exploit, exploited the Victorian obsession with something called table tipping or table turning, which is a practice that seems to have originated, at least in modern times, in America's spiritualist uh, movement. In 1848, the teenage Fox sisters, um, who were later to become infamous, they reported poltergeist activity in their house in New York. And eyewitnesses reported tables spontaneously making knocking sounds, rocking back and forth, and even levitating many feet off the floor. And in 1849, uh, the sisters publicly demonstrated table turning before an audience uh, at the Corinthian Hall in, in New York. And this was a complete sensation. You know, newspapers rapidly spread the word. Now, in those days, uh, relatively speaking, infant mortality was, was high, life expectancy was lower. People were hungry for contact with the spirit world to help with their grief and, and their loss. And so, quite naturally, the spiritually hungry or even just the plain curious attempted to rep replicate this phenomenon in their own homes. And it worked. People's tables at home really did move. And so table turning became an overnight craze. The craze spread to England when an American traveling medium advertised their demonstrations on the front page of the Times newspaper. And within the year, table turning had become fashionable throughout England. The upper, upper classes held um, tea and table turning parties while the lower classes commandeered their kitchen tables. And even Queen Victoria and Prince Albert joined in. So England's tables were moving, animated by invisible ghosts and spirits. In fact, it was so popular that Marx and Engels mention it. Engels briefly mentions table turning in his Dialectics of Nature, where he's satirizing uh, modern spiritualism. 
Uh, Marx mentions table turning in the first paragraph of his famous chapter on the fetishism of commodities. And um, for fun, here, here's the full quote. Uh, begin quote, a commodity appears at first sight a very trivial thing and easily understood. Its analysis shows that it is in reality a very queer thing and bounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. So far as it is a value in use, there is nothing mysterious about it. It is clear as noonday that man by his industry changes the forms of the materials furnished by nature in such a way as to make them useful to him. And then here we go. The form of wood, for instance, is altered by making a table out of it. Yet for all that, the table continues to be that common everyday thing, wood. But so soon as it steps forth as a commodity, it is changed into something transcendent. It not only stands with its feet on the ground, but in relation to all other commodities, it stands on its head and evolves out of its wooden brain grotesque ideas far more wonderful than table turning ever was. End quote. Um, the more modern translation uh, in the Penguin edition by Folks drops, drops table turning, which is a bit sad. Um, so what is this change that occurs in the table as soon as it steps forth as a commodity? Well, a wooden table in the context of a market economy does acquire new properties. The table may be exchanged for other things, a hundred loaves of bread, an engagement ring, tea sets, and so on. But the table acquires this, this new property of exchangeability, and the table's relative price in the market represents these exchange ratios with other commodities. Why do commodities have prices? Uh, well, as most of you, I'm sure, know, Marx points out that the activities of independent private producers has to be coordinated. And in a market economy, that's achieved by feedback in the form of transfers of money that flow in the opposite direction to the transfer of commodities. Act activities, economic activities that produce commodities that are in undersupply tend to sell at higher prices. And therefore, those activities get rewarded with higher monetary rewards. And conversely, those activities that produce commodities that are in oversupply get, um, get punished with lower monetary rewards. And producers are therefore forced to switch from unprofitable to profitable activities. And therefore, the economy in this spontaneous, unplanned manner continually and, and roughly achieves a social division of labor that produces the correct quantity of commodities to meet monetary demand. The demand, however, is skewed by class inequality. So although this division of labor succeeds in reproducing class society, it fails to meet many real human needs. So, you know, so far, so good. That's why commodities have prices. That's the kind of functional role of prices in the market economy. But why do some commodities cost more than others? What determines the relative prices of commodities? And Marx, like the classical economists before him, understood that prices fluctuate with supply and demand. That's obvious. But what really needs explaining is the relatively stable structure of prices over longer periods of time. Why do planes tend to almost always cost more than pens? Why do sofas typically cost about the same as a modern laptop or something? You know, why this structure of prices? And Marx's answer is that in a capitalist economy, due to this competitive scramble for profit, uh, the economy tends towards, but never fully reaches, an attractor state where prices are proportional to the socially necessary labor time required to make them. And so in this hypothetical equilibrium, without profit and without rent, and where supply perfectly meets demand, then prices would perfectly represent labor time. And Marx names this dynamic law that emerges from generalized commodity production, the law of value. And so a plane almost always costs more than a pen simply because it requires much more of society's labor time to produce a plane compared to a pen. So a wooden table acquires not one, but two new properties when it steps forth as a commodity. 
an, an exoteric property, which is its exchange value or its price in the market, and an esoteric property, its, its true value, its underlying value, which is the quantity of labor time to produce it, and which in this talk, for clarity, I'm gonna call its labor value. And a commodity's labor value is the hidden regulator of its market price. So those are the new properties that a table acquires when it functions as a commodity. But why does Marx say that an ordinary table becomes transcendent? And why, why is it far more wonderful than table turning? So Marx, at least in English translation, he talks of a labor value being embodied in commodities. And therefore commodities are merely congealed quantities of labor. But Marx also denies that labor values are literally and therefore physically embodied in commodities, like wine poured into a bottle. Uh, Marx says, begin quote, uh, the labor value of commodities is the very opposite of their coarse materiality, of their substance. Not an atom of matter enters into its composition. Turn and examine a single commodity by itself, as we will, yet in so far as it remains an object of value, it seems impossible to grasp it, end quote. So Marx also asserts that the labor value of an already produced wooden table, say it was stored and sold in a warehouse, its value will change immediately if society adopted new labor saving, saving techniques to make that kind of table. Uh, another quote, the value of commodities is determined not by the labor time originally taken by their production, but rather by the labor time that their reproduction takes, end quote. So the labor value of any commodity is the labor time that counterfactually would be used up if that commodity was produced right now, today. And that seems, on the face of it, a bit like spooky action at a distance, because the unsold commodity sitting on the shelf hasn't changed at all. So in consequence, the value of the commodity is quite strange, maybe even transcendent. Now, during a table turning seance, a spirit inhabits the body of the wooden table, supposedly. The table therefore acquires a new property of being ensouled and this new power of communicating with people. The very same table in the context of a market economy also acquires a new property of being a labor value with a new power of exchangeability with all other commodities. And in both cases, no matter how hard we look, even if we turn the table this way and that, we'll never be able to see the spirit or the labor value hiding within it. These properties become in some sense embodied within the table and yet in another sense are entirely absent, invisible to our senses. And just as the hidden spirit animates the table as it walks along the carpet, its hidden labor value animates its price. The secret that makes all commodities exchangeable is this something hidden, something occulted, a spectral or phantom-like objectivity called value. In fact, in fact, Marx uses that kind of terminology, phantom-like objectivity, sometimes translated as spectral objectivity or ghostly objectivity. So an insult table may appear quite amazing and magical and wondrous, but the same table as an economic value has a ghostly property that is equally real and unreal. And this magic is, is far more wonderful because it is far more powerful. Okay, so in antiquity, uh, belief in gods and spirits was uh, widespread, whereas commodity production was sporadic and, and limited. But of course, by the Victorian era, that situation had reversed. The emergence of capitalism, scientific revolution, this had weakened the hold of religion and superstition. Ancient belief in ensouling, even when repackaged by American spiritualism, 
did clash with scientific skepticism of the time. And in consequence, many scientists, uh, the professional classes, doctors, clergy, you know, exemplars of uh, Victorian respectability, common sense, they turned their skeptical attention to table turning. Indeed, even Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of that fictional paragon of uh, Victorian rationalism, he felt compelled to investigate this phenomenon. So all these people were looking into table turning. And after controlling for, for trickery and deception, uh, these common sense heroes proposed various theories to explain it. And the clergy, skeptical of um, heresy rather than the spirit world, they denounced it as a form of devil worship. Uh, the more scientifically minded turned to invisible forces, uh, such as the recently discovered electromagnetism, or galvanic forces, or even uh, mesmerism or animal magnetism, the force that some believed uh, explained hypnosis. So um, the scientific community by the Victorian era was fully reconciled to the existence of invisible forces. Newton's earlier successful theory of gravity proposed an invisible force that influenced the motion of bodies at a distance without any intervening mechanical medium of transmission. And Michael Faraday's uh, pioneering experiments at the Royal Institution in London revealed the existence of electric and magnetic fields um, that uh, extended into empty space. And if humanity had, you know, for millennia failed to notice such things, then perhaps there were many, many more. Uh, so other more speculative hypotheses were advanced to explain table turning, such as um, ectenic or ectoplasmic force, which was a precursor to the theory of psychokinesis, or odic forces named after the god Odin, which was a kind of like vitalist analog of electromagnetism. Um, but common to all these investigations is that no one denied the reality of the phenomenon. The skeptics nearly differed regarding the cause of it. And that's because the tables really did turn even when skeptics were in control. So Victorian England was faced with an epidemic of ghostly spirits, of spectres, not emerging from the London fog or out of the corner of the eye, but in full view manifesting in the homes of anyone in inclined to invite them. So this was something of a um, mini ideological crisis. Who, who could get to the bottom of this? What person had the right combination of expertise and mysterious phenomena, yet sufficient scientific acumen? Victorian society needed a real life uh, Sherlock Holmes. And they found it in Michael Faraday because his ingenious experiments had discovered new hidden forces in nature. His public lectures at the Royal Institution had captivated young and old alike. He could induce magnetic fields by harnessing the power of electricity. He built and demonstrated marvelous rotary devices that seemed to move of their own accord. You know, his scientific credentials were impeccable. So Faraday was pestered uh, with hundreds of letters uh, from all walks of life, asking him to investigate the mystery of table turning. Uh, for example, uh, William Hickson, editor of the Westminster Review wrote, uh, quote, I'm tempted to do a Victorian voice, but I won't. <laughs> Maybe I will. <laughs> now, if Newton was wise in asking himself, why does the apple fall? Maybe not, with due modesty, ask his successors, why does the table turn, end quote. So Faraday eventually relented. And he began uh, by attending seances to witness table turning for himself, organized by his friend, the Reverend John Barlow, who was secretary of the Royal Institution. And Faraday became convinced that the phenomenon was real uh, and not trickery. So he set to work, and that meant applying the scientific method. So he covered the table with different insulating materials to prevent electrical or magnetic, magnetic forces. And he asked the volunteers to perform the seance in laboratory conditions. The table still moved, so electromagnetism as an explanation was ruled out. And then in 1853, 
Faraday conducted an ingenious experiment. Um, he placed uh, glass rollers between two small boards, which were fastened together, so that the upper board would slide left and right before the lower board would move. Okay, so any lateral force on the upper board would transmit to the lower with, uh, with this lag. And then he attached an upright haystalk that clearly weighed with any lateral movement. And then he placed that entire apparatus on top of the table. And then the volunteers began the seance and the table moved. But before the table moved, the haystalk weighed. And that meant that their hands were causing the table to move. So Faraday concluded that the volunteers were deceiving themselves by unknowingly moving their hands. The subconscious caused table turning. In fact, as soon as the participants realized that it was their hands that were moving the table, the table became entirely still. The spell, the spell was broken. So Faraday communicated his findings in a letter to the Times. He declared that table turning was a psychological, not a supernatural phenomenon due to a quasi involuntary muscular action. And Faraday, as he wryly observed, had turned the tables on the table turners. <laughs> Faraday uh, credited his contemporary, uh, William Carpenter, who was a physician and scientific skeptic, for the theory that explained his experimental results. Uh, Carpenter had noted that uh, bodily responses can be automatically caused by ideas. For example, many of us can um, spontaneously salivate if we imagine we're sucking a lemon. And Carpenter explained many types of anomalous phenomena, such as automatic writing, uh, water dousing with, with rods, the movement of the planchette on a Ouija board. Um, all those things can be explained in terms of um, an idea motor effect, where in the appropriate social setting, a subject's ideas can cause their hands to move imperceptibly, but without them being aware of it. And Carpenter's theories contributed to the very earliest neuropsychological theories of hypnotic suggestion. Modern theories of hypnosis, they continue to emphasize that our subjective beliefs can affect how we, what we perceive to objectively be the case. Um, and there's, there's still a range of uh, different theoretical explanations of hypnosis as a, as a real phenomenon. But bottom up, our bottom-up sensory processing is essentially underdetermined without top-down, non-sensory organizing principles. In other words, the empirical world literally leaves some wiggle room for our ideas to create wiggles. And on this view, hypnotic phenomena doesn't involve unusual or altered states of consciousness, but it's merely a particularly dramatic and confounding example of how we normally function in the world. And so Faraday's explanation that table turning is a kind of self-hypnosis induced by engaging in a shared social practice could also explain more ancient phenomenon of, for example, ensouled objects. Because many people, many ancient people believed that the entire cosmos is identically the body of a supreme immaterial spirit, which is transcendent yet imminent, that animates a hierarchy of lesser gods who in turn animate material world. And so the whole world is already immediately in soul. Temple statues are not miraculous anomalies like they would be in our belief system, but they're just in their belief system, localized and intense manifestations of a, an a priori universal principle. So if Faraday was right, then humanity had been deceiving itself for millennia by unconsciously projecting its own enchanted belief systems outwards onto the physical world as a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy or confirmation bias or mass 
hypnosis. These statues, tables, smoke curling from incense burners, dark mirrors and dark crystals where spirits manifest, they don't host actual spirits, they just host our own imagination. So Faraday chalked up another success for Victorian science. This haunting epidemic could now be safely ignored, relegated from the super supernatural to um, the merely entertaining. Could Victorian science also solve the mystery of the haunted commodity with its phantom-like or ghostly objectivity? And that was certainly Marx's intention. He'd asserted that the labor value was a property of a commodity that could not be found within it. And he also asserted that its labor value could change due to changes in productivity of labor occurring hundreds of miles away. So Marx therefore needed to explain himself to his readers, and that wasn't an easy thing to do. As many of us know, the first part of Capital, where Marx explains value, is not easy. And he, he reworked it many times. And to try to explain himself, Marx uh, drew an analogy with Newtonian gravity. Uh, for example, he says, begin quote, in the midst of all the accidental, ever fluctuating exchange relations between the products, the labor time socially necessary for their production forcibly asserts itself like an overriding law of nature. The law of gravity thus asserts itself when a house falls about our ears. The determination of the magnitude of value by labor time is therefore a secret, hidden under the apparent fluctuations in the relative values of commodities, end quote. So the law of value is a bit like the law of gravity. A bird flies, a shelf stays up, but gravity is always working away behind the scenes. And so eventually the bird is going to fall or the books will you know, tumble to the ground. And this, in a similar way, prices may deviate significantly from their underlying labor values. And this can't persist for too long because real material costs of production eventually assert themselves in the market, sometimes in the form of sudden crises. Marx continues with this gravity uh, analogy. He compares labor values to mass. He writes, labor values, as labor values, all commodities are, de are only definite masses of congealed labor time, end quote. And he also draws an analogy between exchange ratios and weight. So for example, 100 loaves may weigh the same as one kilogram of iron because they have the same mass. And similarly, 40 yards of linen may be worth two coats because they have the same labor value. And after making this point, Marx writes, begin quote, here, however, the analogy ceases. The iron in the expression of the weight of the sugar loaf represents a natural property common to both bodies, namely their weight. But the coat in the expression of the value of the linen represents a non-natural property of both, something purely social, namely their value, end quote. So Marx didn't pursue this analogy, but, um, but we can. So if we think about it, um, an object with mass has a weight in virtue of a local gravitational field in which it's placed. If we change that surrounding field, say by transporting the mass to the moon, then the very same mass will have a different weight. And weight can't be found in the object. It doesn't matter how closely we examine it because weight is a force that acts upon the mass. But even though we can't find weight in the mass, nonetheless, weight is a property of that mass. So does a mass really have a weight? We say it does, but it's not quite accurate to say that because weight is really a relation between a mass, a local gravitational field, and the law of gravity, of gravitational attraction. So we have a property of an object 
that is not a property of the object in itself. And I want to call this kind of property a field property. And it was Faraday who in 1849 first coined the term field to explain the results of his experiments with magnetism and electricity. Faraday, we've all done some experiment at school, placed a paper sheet coated with a thin layer of wax, bar magnet, gently pepper with iron filings, and then the magnetic field lines appear. It reveals the invisible lines of force. Um, and we see a picture of that magnetic field. Um, another experiment that Faraday was famous for is he built a, a, a spherical capacitor made of two brass spheres, one place, one smaller one placed inside the other. Um, he induced a positive charge on the outer sphere um, with an electric current. And then he measured the electrostatic force in the gap between the spheres, which demonstrated the existence of an invisible electric field that extended beyond the metal itself. We take it for granted now, but in those days that was like, wow, there's something invisible uh, in, the, in, the, in the ether, in the air. So just as a mass in a gravitational field is subject to a force called weight, a metal of the right kind in a magnetic field is subject to a magnetic force, and a charged particle in an electric field is subject to an electrostatic force. And modern physics, as we know, takes these ideas much further. The ancient Greek philosopher Thales, he proposed that all things are full of gods or full of spirits. And he said that after observing the power of magnets to move iron and the power of amber when it was rubbed with iron fur to pick up straw. These spirits animated passive matter. That was the explanation. But Faraday's breakthroughs explain the same phenomenon, not with anthropomorphic spirits, but with invisible fields. So Faraday had exercised uh, the spirits from statues and tables, and he also, also from electromagnetic phenomena. Could Faraday also help to exercise the ghostly objectivity of Marx's values? And undoubtedly, I think he could have, if there ever had been a chance meeting between Marx and Faraday in a London pub or something, because Marx, by drawing analogies with mass, weight, and the law of gravity, he was already flirting with a concept of a field and field properties. So let's try and complete that line of thought. So typically, a field associates a quantity with every point in physical space, you know, the strength of the field, uh, like the iron filings we can see, um, a vector, if you want. But the space doesn't have to be a spatial one. Um, so let's consider the state of technology in the whole world right now. and um, and think of the enormous variety of methods that we employ to produce the enormous variety of goods and services that we consume. And imagine that this economic state of affairs as a vast input-output network where each node will represent a particular commodity type and directed arrows between the nodes um, which connect one node to the other, represent the fact that one commodity type gets used up in the production of the one it has a link to. So mathematically, this network is a connected uh, commodity space. Each node is not a point in physical space, but is a point in commodity space. And we can associate a vector, which is simply a list of numbers, with each point in commodity space. So as an example, let's consider the node labeled small three-legged wooden table. And let's say the first number associated with this point in commodity space is the average labor time directly supplied to produce this kind of table. Let's say it's two hours, averaged over all the different labors, all the different uh, firms that produce those kinds of tables. So it takes two hours to transform these raw materials into a wooden table. Let's say the second number is the average quantity of wood directly used up to make that table. Um, third number is the average quantity of glue or the amount of metal studs, wh whatever, it doesn't matter. And let's say we repeat that exercise for every commodity type in the whole world. So lots of points in commodity space with associated um, list of numbers, which specifies 
things that get directly used up to make them. Now, this enormous network is, semantically speaking, identical to what Marx consistently calls the conditions of production. And it's a, a social, not a physical field, and I want to call it the technology field. And I want to be, just assume for the moment that that field is static, that doesn't change, which is untrue, because it's changing all the time. Nodes and arrows wink in and out of existence with every invention of new commodity type or if something no longer produced. Um, the numbers uh, that label those nodes, how much is things are used up, that's changing all the time with any change in the methods of production. But just as physicists start with static fields, we're going to do that too. We can generalize to dynamic fields later. So let's consider the three-legged wooden table. It's just been produced, ready for shipping to a warehouse. What is its labor value? So imagine we start at the table's node in the technology field, and we're going to add to a running total the direct labor time used up to produce it, which was two hours. And we're going to follow backwards all the input arrows to that node. For example, we trace the input of the amount of wood back, and we look at how much direct labor time was used up to make that wood, and we add that to our running total. We do the same for the glue and the metal studs and so on, each time adding direct labor inputs to our running total. But we don't stop there. We need to consider the commodities indirectly used up to produce the timber, the glue, the studs, and so on. And so we recursively trace back all the input arrows backwards in the technology field, adding each direct labor time to our running total as we go. And eventually, this process will asymptote to a definite finite value which represents the total direct and indirect labor time used up to produce this kind of table. And this is its labor value. And that means quite simply that labor value is a field property. The value represents what Marx calls the total coexisting labor supplied to produce that table. By coexisting, he means all the labor supplied in all the different branches of production that cooperatively produce that table and all the necessary direct and indirect inputs that were used up. And a labor value is kind of like a fraction of the total social working day. And in economic theory, that procedure I've just described in, in words is known as vertical integration, and we can compute it by inverting the matrices that represent that graph that I, I mentioned. Now, in electrostatics, the potential energy of a charged particle in a field is the work that would need to be done to move it from an infinite distance away to its present location in the field. That's the definition. Of course, it doesn't move. It's just the definition of it. The labor value of a commodity in a technology field is the work that would need to be done to produce it from scratch. And labor values and potential energy are therefore very similar conceptually because both are instantaneous properties of objects in a field that have math mathematical representations in terms of integrals or sums over the field structure. And this is why Marx, I think, was inspired when he draws his analogy with gravity. A commodity has a labor value in virtue of the technology field in which it's embedded. The labor value cannot be found in the commodity, no matter how closely we examine it, because labor value is a field property. And just as an electric field governs the movement of a charged particle due to laws of electrostatics, and a gravitational field governs the movement of masses due to the laws of gravity, a technology field governs the trajectory of a commodity's market price due to the law of value. Because in all cases, an underlying field property manifests as potential or actual motion of those things under its influence. It's the hidden principle of movement and animation. So does a commodity have a labor value? Yes, but we have to be just clear what we mean by that. Because a labor value is a relation between a commodity type 
a local technology field and the law of value. A commodity really is congealed labor time because it is material wealth that if it was destroyed requires a definite, definite quantity of labor time to recreate it. The destruction of the commodity is identically the destruction of its value, but the value was never in the commodity. So uh, labor value is not literally embodied in a commodity like wine poured into a bottle. It's more like a genie in a bottle, except the genie is not a real spirit, but the hidden property of our own social practices. And Faraday's concept of a field can also help to exercise those interpretations of Marx's theory that uh, get hung up a bit on spooky action at a distance. Mm -hmm. So again, let's return to the wooden table, but now imagine that it has been stored in a warehouse unsold for over a year. In the meantime, the technology field has changed. The world now employs more efficient techniques to make these kinds of tables. So as a result, the labor value of tables of that kind has decreased. And the important point is that the labor value of the table stored in the warehouse immediately alters with every change in the technology field without the need for any causal process or medium of transmission for the simple reason that its value is a property of the field. It's a field property. The change actually has occurred in the technology field. Nothing happens in the material body of the commodity, but such changes in the field do immediately begin to have causal consequences that eventually do manifest. Because a change in the technology field it changes the attractor state of the law of value. Markets, all other things being equal, will start to converge to this new attractor defined by the technology field. So the price of unsold tables and the price of newly produced tables of the same kind, their prices will start to, de to decline relative to other commodities because less of society's labor time is now needed to produce them. And if the demand for such tables remain constant, then some proportion of society's working day would eventually be reallocated to other activities. So this change in the labor value of an already produced commodity doesn't require action at a distance, no more than say the change in status of a person from uh, married to divorced occurs due to a legal act that happens to occur many hundreds of miles away. In both cases, the full causal consequences of this social change don't immediately manifest on the object that is referred to. So labor values have this um, phantom-like objectivity, not because they're ineffable or pure social constructs, but because they are hidden properties of the totality of our conditions of production that in our ordinary daily life only manifest to our senses in the distorted form of exchange values. Okay, so let me uh, now begin to uh, wrap, wrap up and try and summarize uh, what I've been talking about. So Victorian skepticism, especially Faraday's contributions, revealed that insold objects are creations of our own minds. In 1888, those Fox sisters that I mentioned earlier, they admitted that table turning was a hoax. Uh, this occult power that sent tables rocking and knocking across two continents had a human, not a supernatural origin. The spirit summoning was either a conscious lie to deceive others or an unconscious lie to deceive ourselves. All these old enchantments were dying. But Victorian skepticism didn't extend to the value form. Um, as Marx said, and I'm going to have a quote here, in, in the religious world, <clears throat> begin quote, the productions of the human brain appear as independent beings endowed with life entering into relation both with one another and the human race. So it is in the world of commodities with the products of men's hands. This I call the fetishism, which attaches itself to the products of labor so soon as they are produced as commodities, end quote. And the fetish is 
an inanimate object that we worship because we think it's inhabited by a spirit. And the emerging science of economics was fully enchanted by this fetish of the value form, thinking it transcendentally real rather than the imminent creation of our own social activity. And we inherit this bourgeois hubris of a scientific and commercial rationality that thinks itself free of all superstition. But capitalism has its own kind of enchantment because we daily perform a mass ritual that ensouls every object and activity in the world with this property we call economic value. And the movement of these numbers, not under our conscious control, they govern our lives just as much as the ancient gods once did. So we're not free of spirits, but remain haunted by them. So let me bring my ghost story to a close. So my grandparents, they were full of ghost stories. They always believed there was more to reality than met the eye. But my grandfather, he never trusted the gypsy table. And in fact, what he, it's one of the earliest things he did after he recovered from the death of my grandmother was to literally take an axe to it and chop it to pieces. And he burnt it. And at the time, I was really shocked uh, by this and his belief in the supernatural that motivated it. But I've become less judgmental because my grandfather had simply wanted to be free of the spirits that haunted his home. And there I'll stop. Thank you.